The Mexican tetra is a 12 centimeter long fish that lives in a challenging habitat. Pitch black caves where there's not a lot of food. Over time, they've learned how to store four times more energy as fat. And because of the darkness, they no longer have eyes. What they've done is adapted. All species do it, or if they don't, they die out and eventually go extinct. In recent decades, a new habitat the species have had to adapt to garbage, 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 garbage. is our trash. We're filling up the seas with garbage, garbage, garbage. What will Are we moving toward a planet like the one Wally inhabited? Where we have so much garbage that we have to abandon this world and leave it to cute friendship seeking robots to sift through our trash? Wally! <laughs> One of the biggest parts of the garbage problem is plastic. We just keep producing more. And since plastic takes a really long time to break down, it's ending up in our oceans. There are now five unnatural man-made trash zones in our oceans. The largest one being 620,000 square miles circle of gunk. You could find anything from wigs, to lawn furniture, to kitchen spatulas, to golf clubs. And it's getting worse by the day. How does marine life adapt to that? From the Sowers Institute for Medical Research and KCUR Studios in Kansas City, this is Seeking a Scientist, a podcast where science fiction meets reality. I'm Dr. Kate Bieberdorf, aka Kate the Chemist, and on this episode, we're seeking a scientist to explore a new type of ecosystem, our plastic trash oceans. You want to see the most beautiful thing I've ever filmed? Scuttle, look what we found! Human stuff, huh? How are species adapting to this new plastic world? Who perishes? Are there any benefits to this new habitat? It's good for the winners and bad for the losers. What we're doing in our cities, in our homes, somehow is now having an effect on a place so, so far away. Who's to blame? And what can we do to fix it? It's not about doom and gloom. We have to design the future that we hope for. I'll be real with you. Plastic stresses me out. I try to do my part by using canvas totes instead of plastic bags. I cut the plastic soda rings. I recycle my pop cans. But on average, American citizens generate almost five pounds of trash every day. That's 292 million tons of trash per year. And a lot of people think recycling makes a big difference, but the truth is, in the United States, we recycle about 35% of our trash. Now, the EPA estimates that we could recycle about 75% of our trash, but a lot of this waste ends up in our trash bin. So we have a long, long way to go. My friend Danny Washington is a marine biologist and a TV host, and she takes waste and recycling to the next level. She hates plastic, and she really tries to never use disposable plastics. I remember one time we were on set for this thundercloud experiment we were doing, and a producer wanted Danny to hold something for the shot, so she handed Danny a plastic cup, and Danny was just like, no. It really makes me feel good to know that you noticed in, in all the chaos that we were in at that point in production, you know, uh, you were able to notice that behavior change uh, with me. I'm sure you all have a friend like this, or maybe this describes you. She's the kind of person who always carries reusable silverware with her and never uses plastic straws. Of course, I am not even close to being um, a perfectly plastic-free person. Uh, in 2023, it's, it's damn near impossible. But the point is, it's a thing she takes really seriously because she's seen firsthand how destructive plastic can be to the place she loves the most. The ocean. At this point, we're seeing between 4 to 12 million metric tons of plastic enter the ocean each year. That's enough plastic to literally cover every foot of coastline on the planet. And right now, it's projected to triple that amount in the next 20 years as plastic production continues to rise. That's hard for Danny, who grew up on the Florida coast. I remember I was a part of a rescue effort in Miami and Biscayne Bay where we found a, a single manatee who was... Um, engulfed in monofilament or fishing line, which is also made of plastic. So when people go fishing just for, you know, fun and leisure wherever they live and they decide to discard that line, it's going to be in the water for a very long time. And we'll see animals growing with 
this this rope or this line wrapped around them still and their bodies it starts to cut into their their physical flesh which is horrific to see because you're just like wow this animal doesn't have the capability to cut this off themselves depending on the type of plastic it can take anywhere from 20 to 500 years for it to completely biodegrade and if it doesn't have access to sunlight it might never decompose at all when exposed, the UV rays from the sun break the bonds in the plastic, and during that long process, it takes a new form. Plastic will eventually break up into smaller uh, fragments. Uh, they're referred to as microplastics. Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado is a molecular biologist at the Sowers Institute for Medical Research, and he's really concerned about this growing problem and the unknowns it presents. We don't know what happens to those microplastics inside of an, uh, of an individual animal. And we're also talking about animals that more often than not, we don't pay any attention to because they're relatively small and they're not necessarily immediately visible to you. It's the micro stuff that's often overlooked. And that's a problem because the ocean is downstream of everything. So when garbage enters our waterways, all of this debris, the big and the small, eventually ends up there. Now you're bringing a new variable into this very complex equation, which is plastic, to populate an area that was previously inhabited by, you know, millions of years of animals, uh, uh, you know, commingling and living there. These areas where all the trash collects are known as garbage patches. So in essence, they're a collection of trash that perpetually circulates a combination of tiny, broken up plastic particles that are too small to see, mixed in with the bigger identifiable items like buoys, netting, packaging, detergent containers, crates, plasticware, bottle caps. Some areas have so much circulating trash, they look like actual islands made of litter. Now think about this. They're in the middle of the ocean. No humans live there. Like no humans live there, you know, permanently. And yet what we're doing in our cities, in our homes, somehow is now having an effect on a place so, so far away from where we live, and we're not even aware that this is happening. Let me introduce you to the man who first discovered all of this. I'm Captain Charles Moore coming to you from the North Pacific Ocean at uh, 35 degrees north latitude, 138 degrees west longitude on the first pelagic plastic island ever discovered floating in the Pacific. It has hills, coves, and underwater structure. Captain Moore first discovered what has come to be known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch back in 1997. It's more than 1,000 miles off the coast, located between California and Hawaii, and it's the largest accumulation of plastic in the ocean. Below me right now is a fish mausoleum with dead fish that have been caught by the nets that have been trapped here and have continued fishing. Uh, it's also the home to hundreds of fish, many species swimming around underneath us right as I speak. This is their new home that they've gravitated to as there is really nothing fixed in the great Pacific Ocean except our trash. It was pure luck that he even found it. He was traveling from Honolulu, Hawaii to Santa Barbara, California when hurricane winds blew him way off course. And then he started to notice plastic objects bobbing in the water. He says it was like coming across a plastic soup. I didn't see things touching each other. I didn't see a mound of plastic. I just saw something that didn't seem like it didn't belong there. I thought, well, you know, this is kind of weird that I come on deck and in a few minutes I can see something bobbing by. So he started to play a little game. Every time he came on deck, he would look around in all directions and see if he could find any plastic. To win, he had to go 10 full minutes without seeing any trash in the ocean. Spoiler alert, he never won. So I said, you know what? This has got to be more than just Hansel and Gretel leaving a trail of crumbs just for me to follow home. This has got to be a bigger phenomenon. Back in 1999, Captain Moore founded the Algalita Marine Research and Education Organization. And ever since, he has been at the forefront of what he calls the Great Plastics Awakening. So the question is, how did we get here? Well, let's break down how these garbage patches formed. 
One of the most influential things humans have created happened back in 1907 when the first synthetic plastic was invented. Now, the word plastic is a somewhat ambiguous term for a special type of polymer that can be pressed or molded, and it can be used to describe saran wrap, Tupperware, or a kayak. Now, I said plastic is made from polymers, and polymers are big molecules made from repeating units. Just like a paperclip necklace is made from paperclips attached end to end. So each polymer has a unique configuration or paperclip arrangement that gives it its physical properties. And as a synthetic chemist, I admire the process of taking something like a nasty crude oil and turning it into something that is much more user-friendly, like a red Solo cup. It feels a little bit like Cinderella's grandmother turning rags into riches. But at the end of the day, as someone who is also environmentally conscious, I cannot help but be frustrated by the amount of plastic in our lives and oceans. Common plastics found there are polypropylene from bottle caps and plastic straws, polyethylene used to make our takeaway containers and shampoo bottles, and even nylon often found in plastic toothbrushes and fishing nets. Like Alejandro was saying, over time, the UV rays from the sun weaken the plastic polymers, breaking the big plastics into smaller chunks, kind of like what happens when you drop a champagne flute. The larger glass breaks down into smaller pieces. Now imagine picking up each of those tiny pieces and shattering them again. This process repeats on end until we end up with microplastics and nanoplastics in our oceans and they all come together in these places called gyres, which are basically large whirlpools in the ocean caused by ocean currents. These gyres, these circulating bodies of water act as accumulators for things that are floating on the surface. So those circulating bodies of water happen to comprise 40% of the world ocean. Now in the Northern hemisphere, the gyres flow clockwise, but in the Southern hemisphere, they flow counterclockwise. Moore has a complicated relationship with the North Pacific Gyre, the one responsible for the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. He has returned to the patch several times, and as it continues to grow, he thinks more people need to see it with their own eyes to wake up to the severity of the situation and really understand what we're up against. It can be so calm out there that you could just take a piece of plywood and pour inner tubes and pitch a tent on it and just hang out there. Well, I think adventure tourism has got a place out in the garbage patch to really see how this thing is. But part of that is the trip to get there and, and learning how big the ocean is and how we've been able to pollute something that big. How do you feel about being referred to as the discoverer of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Well, I resisted it for a number of years, but I, I actually had an independent, I sort of like the idea of uh, Newton, you know, did he really discover the calculus or was it Leibniz, you know? They're independent thinkers that came up with their own theory. And I'm an independent thinker. I came up with my own theory about the garbage bag. And I'm the one person that went back and did rigorous scientific testing. So I now accept that moniker because I did the work, not just because I was the discoverer, but I did the work to make the discovery stick. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the first discovery was like coming across a big, chunky plastic soup. But since then, throughout subsequent expeditions, you've been finding that these patches are actually growing. And then in your documentary, Sailing the Ocean of Trash with Captain Moore, there's footage of you on High Zex Island, which is a trash island that you physically walked across. All right, I'm currently standing on the highest part of this island, which is actually elevated about a meter above sea level. So we actually do have a mountain of sorts right here on the island. So many questions there. What did it feel like under your feet? How did you feel emotionally about that whole thing? I don't know of anyone else who's actually navigated to an island made out of plastic trash in the garbage patch and walked on it and experienced it like I did. I actually named the coves on it. I felt like Captain Cook mapping a new island, you know, out in the middle of the ocean. The actual island itself was matted rope uh, tangled with buoys that you could walk on and I'd climb on. Moore observed tons of marine life in this new habitat. 
Below the surface, there were tremendous amounts of fish, pelagics like mahi-mahi, dolphins, the rudderfish, all feeding on other species that had gathered. And just recently, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center found 484 different species hanging out on the marine debris. The majority of these species are usually found on the coast. So what's the deal? Why are these animals seeming to do well here? And are all species thriving? It's good for the winners and bad for the losers. Biodiversity is not a zero-sum game. It's, or, or you could look at it as a zero-sum game. There are winners and there are losers, but if you look at the entire sphere that we inhabit, it's biodiverse. All the winners and all the losers have balanced out over eons of time. And yes, there are perturbations where winners predominate and losers uh, are decimated. But over time, there's a kind of a balancing act that happens after a period of time. And if you are going to load the ocean with just surface filter feeders like barnacles and mussels and oysters, these beautiful translucent creatures that I like, like the salps and the larvations, these guys start to lose. One of the species that's struggling is arguably our most important marine life, plankton. Phytoplankton is responsible for the production of about half of the oxygen on our planet. Every morning, zooplankton dive deep into the ocean to hide from predators. Then they return to the surface layer at night to forage for food. But here's the thing. Small pieces of plastic, like bottle caps, look like food to them. Their migration pattern used to keep them safe, but now, due to microplastics, zooplankton are getting confused in the darkness and are consuming tiny plastic particles instead. It's so bad, Moore says that in 2021, the plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch outweighed the plankton by a factor of six to one. It's heavy, I know, but it's not all bad news. When you put animals to the test like this, some of them rise to the occasion. Alejandro Sanchez Alvarado says these days, plastic is a strong selector in an ecosystem. There's going to be some species that will adapt willingly to this new situation, but there'll be others that may not fare as well. You mentioned certain species thrive, um, but other ones don't. Do we know why that is? Why do rats and pigeons seem to do well um, in these polluted environments, but giant pandas and coral reefs die out? Why is that? It's not entirely clear 100%, but I will tell you that big, big player in the uh, success, the potential success of a species to adapt to environmental changes is how diverse is their genome in their population. So if you imagine a deck of cards and you only have aces, okay, and, they, and you can only play the game with aces, okay, if something changes that doesn't allow you to play with aces, you're out. That game is gone. That species is gone. But if the deck is fully populated by not just aces, but uh, twos and threes and fours and, and jacks and queens and kings and whatever, if you have all of them, the chances of you being able to play multiple different games, depending on the conditions that are presented to you and have different strategies to overcome those complications, then you see those species thrive. There's really good examples uh, that, that we've seen this, uh, that highly, highly diverse populations will actually withstand uh, pollution for a very long time. There's the case of the uh, Atl Atlantic killifish on the eastern coast of the United States. They've been exposed to all kinds of uh, really, really bad industrial pollution, and yet they did okay, while other species did not. Now, that's because their genetic diversity is so immense that there were some of these combinations of genes that under these conditions, just like a deck of cars, Ah, this is fine. I can deal with this. No problem. We'll keep on reproducing. But it should also be said that there must have been also a large collection of combinations of genes in this fish population that did not fare well, and they're gone. And we'll never know about those. And, and that's the thing we have to be very cautious. Just because some animals survive in really, really bad environments doesn't mean that all of them had the same chance of surviving. And we're only going to know about the ones that survived. We're not going to know about the ones that did not survive. Now, if you have another species that is not as lucky and all they have are aces in their cards, 
I mean, the chances are that the minute you perturb that environment, they're not going to be as fit and they will eventually disappear. So killifish are like the celebrity fish of polluted waters. The ones that survive all have the same basic adaptation, a desensitization of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor pathway. So in other words, these proteins have no problem breaking down the toxic compounds that should kill them. There are over 1,200 different types of killifish, and they are the perfect example of Darwin's survival of the fittest theory. Of course, some of them are better at adapting than others. One group living in a sulfur-rich spring in Mexico found a way to survive on extremely low concentrations of oxygen. Another group that was sent to space learned how to swim under weightless conditions, and when their sibling eggs hatched, they too could swim without gravity. For comparison, when goldfish went to space, they started to swim in a looping pattern and appeared to be absolutely miserable. My favorite example of evolution is Darwin's famous finch experiment. It's a classic that shows how birds' beaks can adapt based on their food supplies. And that's what genetic diversity is all about. We don't know what we're going to need our genes for because we never know how the environment is going to treat us. But we are in a place in our history as a species where we are now controlling most of the time the environment in which we live. So in, in some ways, Kate, I mean, our species is living with prehistoric genes in a postmodern world. That's exactly what's going on here. So there's a disconnect. Our genes were selected to do something specific. We have now changed our environment, so our genes are now adapting to that. And by extension, our activities now are spilling over into the rest of that large ecosystem that's this close uh, system that's our planet. Yeah, it makes me think of this quote I found from Brittany Barrowick, a science writer with the Pacific Standard. She said, as animals come to grips with the new reality of life on Earth with humans, evolution marches on, as has been the case for thousands and thousands of lineages over millions of years. Only now, it's a race to adapt to what we're doing to the planet. What do you think about that? Every species has a superpower, but it is an invisible superpower. And that superpower only becomes apparent when the species is gone. Because that's when you realize how much that species was doing to keep the entire house in order. And the minute you take that away, that's when the superpower is revealed. As a scientist, I think that it's fantastic to see evolution unfold, especially in the presence of this new challenge, this challenge that we humans are, are providing nature with. It's exciting to see, you know, how species are adapting, but at the same time, I know that comes at a cost and that there are going to be some things that we don't understand, might disappear before we understand them, and therefore there may be a sense of loss uh, at the end of the day. I find this next statistic hard to say out loud. Of all the species that have ever existed on Earth, 99.9% .9 of them are now extinct. We are never going to see the dodo bird, the Tasmanian wolf, the Siamese flat barbelled catfish, the golden toad, the paradise parrot, the Xerxes blue butterfly, the Guam flying fox, or the crescent nail tail wallaby ever again. Unless some Jurassic Park TV magic is successful, of course. It's, it's a dinosaur. Uh -huh. Listen, if there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free, it expands to new territories, and it crashes through barriers painfully, maybe even dangerously. Currently, it is estimated that we have approximately 8.7 million species, plants and animals, on Earth. But every year, 100,000 mammals and 1 million seabirds are killed by frickin' plastic in our oceans. I know, I know, it's super depressing. And I'll be honest, when I was talking to Captain Charles Moore, it got a little too sad for me. And I tried to move on to talking about solutions, which we'll get to in a second, but he stopped me. Before we move on, I just have to reiterate that pain and suffering and slow death are the fate of innumerable species caused by vagrant plastic particles. And if we want to quantify that, it has to be up into the millions. Well, then how do we fix it? Cleanup is, is an impossibility, but stopping it is also impossible. When we think about what would be involved in slowing plastic production, because that's, that's what will, will have to happen. You see, 
my colleagues and others have done studies looking at the increase in plastic production versus the increase of plastic in the environment. So the fact is that every percentage increase in plastic production, that same percentage will increase the amount of plastics in the environment. That is a fatal flaw in the system. It can't go on forever. There are limits. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you on that. There, There's no real way around it. We have to... S- it's tough because I'm a chemist. And so I understand there are some very good purposes of plastic. And so there are some times where it is a nice thing to have. But in the end, it's the disposable plastic that is a humongous problem. We need to, in my opinion, we need to start there, completely get rid of all disposable plastic, and then we can take a step further and figure out how we're going to get rid of traditional plastics right now, what we replace them with. Um, Because we know when we put the plastics in the ocean, there are now reports saying that there are leaching chemicals from the plastic into the ocean and it's absolutely affecting the ecosystem. So I agree with you. I mean, we have to limit the plastic production. It's very difficult to do. I think uh, a better word is impossible. It's proven impossible. There's no evidence that any intervention is making a difference. Uh, we're grabbing this, we're grabbing that, we're, everyone is, is running, doing their own thing. They're going to get take out their own way. They're going to have it their way. And uh, to have it their way, the most easy packaging solution is plastic. I mean, there are solutions, but they're not to scale, and the industry fights them tooth and nail. Well, and how does that make you feel? Angry, but uh, I've been angry about that, you know, from before I was uh, involved with plastic pollution. There's got to be some form of fairness. Just like we want biodiversity as a form of fairness for life, we need uh, economic diversity as a form of fairness for the economy. And we don't have that. We have a tremendous uh, gap between the haves and the have-nots that's increasing. And I think that's the root cause of uh, many of the problems, including uh, excess waste. Like many things, it all goes back to capitalism. My friend Danny Washington says the same thing, and it probably won't surprise you that she and Captain Moore know each other. Captain Moore, he's, he's an OG of the game. <laughs> I know Danny Washington. He's a friend of mine. Yeah, tell her hi from Captain Moore. Danny agrees that the plastic industry and the consumers are part of the problem. But she doesn't think it's fair to put all the blame on the consumer, us. She wants the businesses to step up. And I really hope that those who are manufacturing plastic, those who are responsible for these plastic products, will do more and do better and stop pretending that this is not a problem and to actively work toward a solution with the resources that they have and stop blaming the consumer. Because at the end of the day, yes, supply and demand is real. And yes, if the consumer is demanding this product, they're going to continue to make it. But that doesn't mean that they can't innovate, that they can't figure out another alternative. And having a triple bottom line rather than a single bottom line where it's just about profits, but where people, the planet, and then profits at the end um, are prioritized. Danny is right. Thankfully, scientists are taking small steps in the right direction. For example, researchers at the University of Sydney recently discovered that two fungi can break down a type of plastic in 140 days, so about four and a half months. And then there was some success with a corn bioplastic that can break down in about two or three months. But one of the most promising results involves an invasive brown seaweed that can be used to replace plastic wrap that decomposes after two weeks in the compost bin. We have a lot of work to do to get there. So how do we bring that into reality? What's the future that we're envisioning? It's not about doom and gloom. And it's not about projecting this idea that we're, we're just screwed and nothing's going to work. Like, we have to design the future that we hope for, where we see just, equitable, and regenerative solutions being brought to the forefront. And we could do that, you know? It's just a matter of collective vision. It's about innovation. It's about creativity and bringing all these different ideas and minds and backgrounds and experiences to the table so that we can come up with the best solution possible. When it comes to plastic pollution entering the ocean, 80% of it is coming from land-based sources. 
So that means that we have an opportunity to intercept those pieces of plastic before they enter the water. On top of local and individual efforts, a few nonprofit organizations are stepping onto the scene. The Ocean Cleanup has gained some notoriety on social media because they have built some high-tech interceptors and positioned them at the mouth of 10 specific polluter rivers. With their research, they've learned that 80% of the plastic that enters the ocean comes from 1% of the rivers on Earth. So they are focused on the worst polluter rivers. As of today, their interceptors have removed about 5 million pounds of trash from our rivers. Another, more adorable solution is Mr. Trash Wheel. This interceptor also hangs out at the end of the river and collects its trash and is particularly effective after big storms. The semi-autonomous receptor is designed to get people's attention. It has giant googly eyes and uses both hydro and solar energy to maintain its daily function, collecting up to 38,000 pounds of trash a day. My favorite, favorite um, innovation that I've seen so far is a Dutch startup that's called the Bubble Barrier. They basically tested this in one of the canals in Amsterdam where they use a perforated tube to create bubbles, a bubble wall, literally, from the bottom all the way to the surface. And from there, it continually pumps air so that these bubbles will generate these, like a curtain that will prevent plastic from moving beyond that point. So once it's pushed to the side, there's a catchment system, and then the technology allows them to collect that plastic, remove it from the water, but more importantly, it allows migrating fish to easily pass through the bubbles. So you're not worried about collecting marine life instead of plastic. <laughs> what an ingenious solution. Bubbles! Danny's also partnering with the Ocean Race to fight for a universal declaration of ocean rights. As a leader in this movement, she aspires to protect the ocean by establishing a set of rules to keep the plastic out of the water. And our goal at the end of this year, towards September, is to head to New York City during United Nations General Assembly and present a resolution, suggestion, for a universal declaration of ocean rights, where it would provide the framework for people around the world to acknowledge the inherent rights of the ocean. But I think it's it's so important that no matter what walk of life you're on, no matter what you do, you can get involved. The ocean is our life source and it requires everyone to contribute. And I, I want to mention that the, the nature's rights movement has been led and is being led by indigenous peoples around the world, which is what should have been happening a long time ago, because we're seeing that these First Nations and indigenous peoples are the ones who have been the closest to nature, who have understood nature in the most intimate way. And without their leadership, we're, we're heading to a dead end. We need Indigenous people at the forefront, helping make those decisions and, and helping create the framework. Danny has a big battle ahead of her, but so do all of us. I know it's nearly impossible to be plastic free in 2023, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make things better. What if we all just picked one thing to cut back on? For me, it's single-use plastics and being diligent about recycling. Just think about how good it will feel to know there are fewer takeaway containers and water bottle caps floating in the ocean. Even Captain Moore, who said a complete ocean cleanup was impossible, does his part by growing an organic vegetable garden for his community. Ultimately, we all have to adapt. Thanks for listening to Seeking a Scientist. If you liked it, please write a review or share it with a friend. It'll help us celebrate these badass scientists and get them that standing ovation they so deserve. Seeking a Scientist is a production of KCUR Studios in Kansas City, made possible with support from the Stowers Institute for Medical Research and design help from PRX. It's hosted by me, Dr. Kate Bieberdorf, aka Kate the Chemist. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Kate the Chemist or on Twitter at K A the Chemist. This episode was produced by me, Suzanne Hogan, and Byron Love with mixing help from Paris Norvell. Mackenzie Martin is our editor, Gabe Rosenberg is our digital editor, and special thanks to jean Viev de Marteau and the Stowers Institute. Our original theme music is by The Coma Calling, and you heard music from Blue Dot Sessions and Pete Seeger and Pink Floyd. And clips from Wally, Relaxing White Noise, American Beauty, Quiet Music, The Little Mermaid, Mission Unstoppable, Sailing the Ocean of Trash with Captain Moore, Jurassic Park, and Jerry Maguire. Next time, what if powerful lasers could fix our energy problems? Just two years ago, the Texas grid was minutes away from collapsing. 
What would load shedding look like in the U.S. if our grid were to crash? I live in constant fear of jumping into that elevator and not realizing that it's time for the power to shut off and them getting stuck for two hours. Until then, if you want to see pictures of these crazy trash islands that Captain Moore has been exploring, or a video of Danny Washington and I doing a huge explosion with 70 other women in STEM, check out our Instagram at Seeking a Scientist or Twitter at Seeking a SciPod. You can also subscribe to our email list at seekingascientist.org.